Okay. All right, awesome. All right, well, welcome everyone to Business Library Chip. It's not that scary. Uh, I'll be our ringleader for today, but you're going to hear from all of us, all five of us. Uh, my name is Morgan Ritchie Baum. I use she, her pronouns. I am at uh, Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, uh, but before being an academic librarian, I was a public business librarian. Um, joining me today, and because of so many of us, uh, you'll get to meet each of our speakers um, shortly, but we have Sean Bennett from NC State, David Ernsthausen from UNC Chapel Hill, Nancy Lovis from UNC Chapel Hill, Angel Truesdale from UNC Charlotte, also a former uh, public librarian, uh, and then myself. Um, so before we jump in, I'm going to ask Devin um, to just launch a quick, um, two quick polls, just so we kind of get a, a read of the room. So if you want to launch those, Devin. So if you could just let us know um, what kind of library you work in, if you work in a library, um, that would be wonderful. We'll let um, everyone have a second to do that. And Devin, if you want to let me know when we get to like, I don't know, like 85-ish percent. All right, so we've got, looks like 67% academic librarians, 29% public librarians, and then 4% from special libraries. That's great. Okay, all right. So Devin, if you can go ahead and then launch the next poll. All right, so when somebody asks you a question related to business or personal finance, even if it's not overtly business or personal finance, if you get an inkling, that it's business or personal finance related. How, how does that make you feel? And there's a lot of other uh, ways I could think of describing this as well, but those were just the first few words that came to mind. I've experienced all of those. <laughs> How's it looking, Devin? We've got about 74% um, who responded, so I'll I'll share it out in a sec. Anxious? Yes. So right now I'm seeing that the predominant feeling is anxiety, for sure. 43% are saying they feel anxious. Intrigued was the next one, so that's good, followed by excited, also good. And then looks like tied for last, just confused and annoyed. So all very valid feelings. So, um, and that's kind of why that anxiety that so many of you seem to connect with, um, and probably it's a combination of all those feelings, uh, is one reason we were really excited to partner with NC Live to talk about business librarianship. Um, because one thing we want you all to gain from this is that you're all business librarians, right? You all have the skills uh, to practice business librarianship, even if that's nowhere in your title. So we're here today to hopefully make that feel a little less intimidating, a little less scary, give you some tools and some resources uh, to, to make um, answering business-related questions a little bit easier. Uh, and luckily, thanks to NC Live, uh, you have some great tools to do that. So we'll be talking about some NC Live tools that everyone um, who has access to NC Live has access to, but then we'll also talk about some open access resources, but just some kind of general tips and tricks um, for making it through some of those business reference questions. We want this, we're, as Devin said, we're a pretty fun group, I like to think so, and we're very conversational. So I have the chat up. So at any time, if you have questions, comments, please drop those in the chat. We'll kind of be stopping in between each section just to make sure we're um, answering any questions anyone has. You'll get our emails at the end of this if you feel more comfortable asking us questions offline. So please don't hesitate um, to reach out to us. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to our first presenter, which is Nancy. So Nancy, if you want to take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm Nancy Lovis, and I have worked as a business librarian for about five years now, and I think it's great fun. And uh, to start us off, I'll 
go through kind of a brief definition of business information. And so I have, um, have you ever been sitting at the reference desk or answering the reference or chat email and gotten questions like, um, what are all of the companies that do a thing like FFPE tissue processing or creating plant-based deli meat? Um, heads up, I don't know what FFPE tissue processing is and neither does my colleague who offered this question as an example, so we Googled it. Or have you gotten a question like how many people like or purchase or buy or look at a thing or a service like sports or pet food, lawn care or hair services? Um, what about the question, how can I market my product or service? Um, or maybe someone's looking for the GDP or the annual income or the average salary in an industry or some other economic number that probably exists somewhere, but I don't know where. Hello, Google. And then the last kind of example, how can I get started with investing stocks? Um, all five of us have gotten some version of these questions in various shapes and forms. And uh, on the surface, they can feel really challenging. Uh, so let's go a little deeper into what business information can be. Oh, yes. Yeah. So there is a fabulous book called Making Sense of Business Reference. And in that book, the author divides out business information into four categories that Ross calls the core four. And these are company information, which kind of sound, it kind of is what it sounds like, just information about companies. Uh, the next one is industry information. And that is, um, Celia Ross calls this the cornerstone of business reference. These types of questions are often, are usually the most frequent types of questions that we get at the desk or you know, in, in consultations. And these can also be the most difficult, um, which I think it means it's they're the most fun. Um, the third category is, oh, the industry information. These are often multidisciplinary and overlap with these other kind of categories. Um, but then this third category is investing or financial information. And the fourth one is um, consumer information and business statistics. And so these categories are really broad. And like I mentioned before, there's a lot of overlap between them, but it can be really helpful just to have these categories to break down questions and topics that feel really big and hard. To have these categories to break those questions down into something that is smaller and achievable. There's that old saying, the only way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time. Um, and so, having this framework to break questions down um, and know what type of information the patron is asking for, um, that's a great strategy for getting started. Um, and so now let's play a game. So I'm going to give the instructions really quick and then we'll get started. Um, so I'm going to share a business reference question and you, the audience, are going to categorize it using the categories at the top of this slide. Um, these questions have may have many categories, multiple, so share as many as you think fit the topic. Uh, so we're going to use chat for the answers. So after Morgan displays the question, go ahead and get your answer ready in chat, but do not hit enter. When I say go, that's when you should hit enter to send your chat. All right, so the first question is, how can I get started with investing stocks? So I'll give y'all a moment to think about that. What categories might this question fit? Okay, on your mark, get set. Go. Yes, investment and financial. And there also may be some consumer as well. Um, all right, the next question, or the answer is kind of investment, financial, and company. 
Um, Because if you're wanting to buy stocks in a company, you might want to learn some things about that company. All right, the next question is, what's the average wage for farm workers in North Carolina? So again, wait until I say go. All right, on your mark, every, wait, do not press enter yet. I didn't say go. <laughs> um, all right, on your mark, get set, go. Business statistics, industry, um, economic data. And so, yeah, that kind of fits into like the statistical industry information um, categories. All right, third question. What is the market share of American Airlines? So again, get your answer ready, but wait until I tell you to hit enter. All right, on your mark, get set, go. Company, industry, business statistics. Um, yes, and then what, what category did I sign that, Morgan? Industry and company information. All right, I have, there's two more questions in our game. And the next one is, how can I market my lawn care business? Once again, get your answer ready. On your mark, get set, go. Consumer, industry, business statistics, yes. Great, all right. And last question. What are the quarterly sales in EBITDA, which means earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization? I had to Google what that acronym meant. For each Starbucks location in North Carolina. I'll give you all a, a few extra seconds because this one um, can, I don't actually remember what I said the answer was. <laughs> all right, on your mark, get set, go. Company and financial information. Yes. All right. So now that we have practiced categorizing um, business info, that these business reference questions, um, I hope that from that exercise you can see just how breaking it down. And then now that we know kind of what category a particular question may fit into then we know which information source we can start with. Um, and we'll get more into like kind of how you go from question, information category to then deciding which information source, that's the next section. Um, but it's really just breaking this down into steps, smaller steps. Um, okay, thanks for playing my game. I hope you had fun. Um, and I'm happy to play this game more with you later uh, too. So next slide, please. Um, to wrap up this explainer section, I want to just share a few things that you can keep in mind, um, what librarians can or should do, and then also what we cannot do. Uh, boundaries are really important for health and well-being professionally and personally, and we're just really here to support you in figuring out what your boundaries are in relation to business information and business librarianship. Uh, so what we can do is uh, do a thorough reference interview and asking open-ended questions instead of, you know, we're just, we're learning as much as the patron is. Um, I often have no idea what the researcher is asking about until I ask them, so what do you actually mean by this phrase? And then we Google together. Um, and then also the, uh, be flexible and creative. Um, that's what I think is most exciting about business questions and business information is just the immense amount of creativity I get to exhibit in my reference interactions. Um, and we're referring, we can refer patients to information sources. We don't have to do the research for them. Um, we can share business plan templates. Can't write the business plan for them, but we can show them the templates. Um, we can. This is similar to the previous one. We can connect patrons to resources in the community. And we'll talk a little more about that later in the presentation. Um, and remember that our role is as a research guide. Um, so we are there to 
help patrons, you know, just like every other reference interaction in any other any other subject or topic. Um, we're just there to guide patrons in the direction that can might help them get to where they want to go. And so for the can't do question column, we can't find an answer to every question and not every business question has an answer. So becoming comfortable with the fact that I can't answer every question. I had one yesterday that cannot be answered. We also cannot do extensive research for patrons. That's not in our job description. If someone wants to pay me the big bucks to be a personal researcher, they can do that, but that's not currently my job. <laughs> um, we also cannot give advice. Um, you may be familiar that we cannot, librarians should not give legal advice. This also extends like financial advice, information advice about patents or intellectual property. Um, here's the anything legal. Can't do that. Cannot submit business registration forms. And we're also not the patron's assistant. Remember, we're the guide, not the assistant. Um, and that is the conclusion of my section. And I'll pass it over to Sean to talk more about what to do after you have categorized your reference question. Thanks, Nancy. Appreciate it. Um, and just real quick, Sean, before you start, were there any questions about that previous section um, that anybody wanted to come off mute and ask or drop in the chat? You all seem like business reference pros already. You got this. <laughs> all right. I'll be watching the chat. but OK, I'll keep an eye on it as well. Um, so. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sean Bennett. I'm with the North Carolina State University Libraries. I've been doing uh, business and education librarianship for, uh, I think, about four years now. Time has no meaning over the last four years or so. Um, but I'm going to talk in my section a bit about workflows and how we might want to use these, codify them in some ways, um, and the different things they can help us with in our systems. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide, if you would. So this uh, mildly terrifying looking thing is my workflow for NC Live resources. And I realize it might look sort of insane when you first look at it, uh, hence the meme on the right side. But this kind of a workflow is incredibly helpful for a number of reasons. First, you know, we're all, we all have workflows as we go into things. It's just a natural progression of how we do our work. Um, but codifying it like this and actually writing it down forces us to think about the workflow and why we're making the choices we are. Why are we starting here? Why are we not going here? Um, and you can see all these on the left side. That's basically what Nancy was just talking about. What kind of reference question is this? Let's, we can talk with the patron, figure out what they're actually looking for, because in many cases, they don't actually know what they need yet. Uh, it's our job to guide them into it. And then you can follow these paths through various resources. Now, this is just NC Live stuff. Um, and I think it's really important to have a workflow that just focuses on the NC Live resources. Uh, many of us come from different institutions that have additional business resources that we've purchased on our own, but not all of our patrons have access to that. If I have members of the public that come into NC State, I can't offer stuff like Business Analyst Online or Privco. Um, and especially important for students and seniors who are graduating and want to go do interesting things, but they're gonna lose access to those terribly licensed products that we all love. Um, so it's nice to have an NC Live workflow to say, look, we're just going to stick with the stuff that you're going to have access to as long as you've got that North Carolina Public Library card. So for this particular one, you'll notice that almost everything ends up at ABI Informed Collection, and we'll talk more about that later on. But for this, you can kind of say, well, all right, I get a lot of market research questions, so I tend to start there. I'm going to go into what I would call the high specificity resources first. I like to go from high to low specificity. So, and my reasoning behind this is because a lot of my patrons, at least in my setting, they firmly believe that there is the perfect report somewhere that will have exactly what they need in one sentence. And if I can just find it for them, their life will be perfect. So we start with those high specificity resources to say, well, we'll try it. It's probably not going to be in here, but then we'll just work down the line to go from like the business market research collection to census and ACS data. Then we'll open up data axle and play around in there. And if we still can't find anything, we'll go to the ABI informed collection and see what we can find. And another one of the reasons we talk about workflows and one of the reasons we wanted to bring this up is it's also a way of writing down and thinking closely about how you want to teach the patron because they're coming to you because they don't know business research, of course. And this is a way of saying, well, how do I want them to approach 
their research? Where do I want them to start? Where do I want them to think, okay, I've got a question. I'm going to start with this database. So for my purposes, I like the high to low specificity workflow because it teaches them, you know, sure, go for the long shot first, try that first, but then realize you're probably going to have to use some lateral thinking, filter down and look at the more generalized resources. All right, let's go to the next slide if you would, Morgan. So I'm gonna show you a quick example here. Uh, this is actually a question I've gotten a lot over the last week. It makes me think there's a class somewhere uh, working on this that I don't know about, but they're very interested in the market for EV chargers in North Carolina and in particular in Raleigh. So you could uh, click forward for me, Morgan. So in this case, I started out with the high specificity, the business market research collection. This was a senior who was graduating. So I wanted to stick with the NC Live resources. We used our Boolean search. Oh, thank you, Nancy. Electric vehicle, right? <laughs> um, and sort of unsurprisingly, there was not, in fact, a perfect market report in all those results for electric vehicle chargers. So from here to the next one, uh, we went to the census and the American Community Survey or ACS data. If you haven't been to the new census site, um, it's actually really nice. Now, in this case, there was absolutely nothing on this. <laughs> so just Nothing helpful, but it was nice to be able to show the patron and say, look, sometimes there is going to be some great stuff in here. So our next stop uh, was then Data Axle. And interesting thing about Data Axle in this case was my first instinct was to look for uh, companies that specialize in this. But if you do that, you're going to get actual physical EV charging stations around North Carolina, which is not quite what they were looking for. So we ended up thinking about this kind of laterally and looking up jobs for electric vehicle charger installers within 100 miles of Raleigh. It turns out there's seven people, seven companies right now, or seven positions rather, um, actually looking for people related to EV chargers. So not quite what they wanted, but we're getting closer. And then finally, we went to ABI Inform Collection because this is really my last stop for everything. Um, you can see we got far too many results with this, lots of narrowing, lots of discussion with the student about how to best do this. Uh, but we did end up finding some opinion pieces in here and sort of almost more importantly, news reports about legislation coming up that could have major impacts on the electric vehicle charging market. So using this workflow in this case kind of brought us from those high to low specificity databases and ended up with, you know, probably not exactly what the patron was hoping for, to be honest, you know, that nice market report, but at least gave them some data and some things on the side that they could then work on and pursue in the future. So I'm going to then pass this forward to our real world questions sections. I think David's taking uh, the next section there, but this is yeah. where we're going to go over uh, kind of real world examples and talk about these resources in more detail. So before uh, we jump in here, any questions? I love Sean's workflow. When Sean created that workflow, we were all like, oh my God, it's like our brains on paper. <laughs> the one that has all the resources, including the NC State stuff is much worse. <laughs> I have a question. Um, yeah, uh, go ahead. That's a really great workflow. I super appreciate that. And it's uh, inspiring, honestly, um, for for organizing my own understanding of resources available. Um, uh, and this might be a, a broader information for the end. So feel free to put it on pause. But um, do you have experiences with sharing resources and workflows and, you know, all of uh, this availability in a proactive way when people don't think of the library as a business research resource to begin with? Yeah, so that's a great, uh, great question. And I will actually, that's going to be one of the last things I'm going to be talking about. Um, so we talk about that in like the context of your local business ecosystem in your community. Um, so we will definitely talk about that. And I'm sure all my colleagues here will have some things uh, to say about that. I think definitely towards the end, but, but yes, we will definitely come to that. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. And I will say before we jump uh, over to David for these real world questions, um, these are not necessarily going to be step by step tutorials on how to use the databases. NC Live does a 
fabulous, fabulous job offering trainings um, for these resources. Plus, it'd be a lot of uh, screen sharing and between five people, which could be a technological disaster. Uh, so if any of the answers that we come up with with some of these real world questions intrigue you, please reach out uh, to NC Live for training on any of these resources, or you can also reach out to your friendly Blink members, which we're all members of the Blink, and you'll have our email addresses for um, any sort of in-depth tutorials on any of these resources. I'll um, link to some of those tutorials in my follow-up email as well. So yes. folks, if you're looking for that specific instruction, um, you'll get it. Thank you, Devin. All right, David, I'm going to turn things over to you for our first real world question. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm David Ernst Towson. I've been a business librarian for 32 years now um, at UNC Chapel Hill Keenan Flagler Business School. Currently, prior to that, I was at Wake Forest. Um, these are a couple of examples of uh, resources. Uh, first one, Data Axle, as you all know, has several different modules. Um, the two that I really want to highlight are the Business Search and the Consumer Lifestyles Project. Um, the, in the Business Search, how many companies in a particular industry are in a particular area? Very common question. Um, especially for people starting a new business. They want to find out how much competition they're going to have. So how many um, oh, restaurants are in a, within a five mile radius of a particular address? We can find that using this particular database. Um, we can also get a list of all of the companies with a particular name. Um, in a class that I teach, I ask the students to find all of the Cold Stone Creameries in the Charlotte metropolitan area, which you can do. Um, in the consumer lifestyles approach, this is really good for finding how many people meet a specific type of characteristic in, again, a specific geographic area. Um, it might be how many people belong to a particular political party, how many people have a based on data axles estimations, have a particular household income, or a particular race, a particular age, a particular gender. Um, really useful for trying to find out where are the consumers who might wanna buy my particular product. Again, great source for people starting a business. The hint I have here is always use the advanced search. There is a basic search, but in my experience, the advanced search is much more flexible and for me, gives me better results quicker. So this is a, uh, a great tool, particularly for people starting a new, starting, starting a new business. Uh, next slide, please. Morningstar, this is NC Live's best resource, in my opinion, for finding information for people who are doing investing. Morningstar is a great source for finding information on stocks, mutual funds, something called exchange traded funds that are traded on US stock exchanges, uh, New York Stock Exchange, American Stock Exchange, and NAS NASDAQ Stock Exchange. Um, questions you can answer. What are analysts saying about, I say ABC, so what are analysts saying about Twitter? What are example, analysts saying about Tesla, Boeing, Biogen, any of those? We can also screen using this database. So if you don't have a particular stock or a particular mutual fund, you can find, hey, I want a list of Morningstar five-star rated funds or three-star rated funds. And you, can, and you can do that using this database. Other ways you could screen with this, say, I wanna find a list of companies that have seen their net income grow by 10, between 10 and 25% over the previous years. All of these things can be useful for somebody who's doing new investing. The records, for this database are wonderful. Um, there are is anal analysis by Morningstar employed um, analysts. You can also get basic summary financial information. You don't get the complete financial statements, but you get um, all of the key um, income and balance statement uh, data points. And you can usually get it for between uh, three and five years or more. So it's a fabulous tool for that. Next slide, please. This one I'm going to throw back to Sean, since Sean likes to talk about ABI Inform, <laughs> and I do agree with him. It is a fabulous 
resource for all kinds of questions. Thank you, David. Um, I actually had a, a very uh, contentious relationship with this database that I'll talk about towards the end there. But um, so ABI Inform, you know, I, I kept referring to it as a catch-all, but it really is fantastic for that kind of thing because there are reports, trade publications, academic journals, newspapers, wire feeds. There's an enormous amount of material in this thing. And it's really great for those research questions that are just off the wall. Like yesterday, just yesterday, that second question, somebody asked me, how do music venues in bars make money? Because they want to go set up a music venue on a street near me. Uh, and they weren't sure if they need to make their revenue at the door using cover fees, charging tickets to go see the audience or see the music rather, or at the bar itself. Like where are they making the money and how do they plan that out? And we actually did find an opinion piece inside ABI from a bar owner who was complaining about how difficult it is to make revenue using a combination of all those streams. So was it perfect? Absolutely not. Uh, I'm sure he would have preferred to get a big chunk of data that showed him exactly what to do. But it was a really interesting example of how far ABI can reach. You know, it's not guaranteed, but there's a ton of information in there and it's a great place to kind of stretch your Boolean search skills and see what's available. Now, I say it was a contentious relationship because until they added that exclude wire feeds button, I refused to use this. And I think that was actually from uh, pressure from NC Live, so my memory could be poor. Basically, the wire feeds inside ABI Inform will include advertisements for market reports. And these are incredibly frustrating for patrons because they'll see, oh, it's a market report for cutting boards in kitchens. This is a real world example. Um, I need that. And it says we have the full text and I clicked on it and all I got was this ad, what's going on? Well, that, that is the full text. It's literally just the advertisement. But if, the, if you train patrons and they're looking for market research to hit exclude wire feeds, it generally removes those from the results. Um, and I, I honestly refuse to use ABI for longest time because it was such a terrible experience in that regard. So just keep that in mind when you're using this. Uh, next slide, I believe I am passing it over to Angel. Thanks, Sean. Um, so I am Angel Truesdale. I'm with UNC Charlotte um, now. I've been here as the dedicated business librarian for three and a half years. But before I came here, I worked for eight years at Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, the public library here. Um, and I worked in the reference department that um, regularly gave out um, business and nonprofit um, um, reference um, and information. Um, and one of the things that, I, and it was actually helpful coming into this job. And one of the things that we used at the public library a lot, and sometimes what I show my students is the business plan handbook from Gale. So we have Gale eBooks provided by NC Live. And this is one of them. So we have volume 41. Um, and the main thing you'll see here is the question at the bottom, where can I find a business plan template? Any business, especially those who um, are going to rely heavily on going out to the community, marketing, all that good stuff, will need a business plan um, template or a business plan. Um, and this is even just helpful for them to think about um, whether they want to start a business or a nonprofit. Um, um, so one of the things that you're looking at, oh, I lost my notes. <laughs> um, so one of the things that you may be looking at is kind of the industry outlook for what you're doing. Obviously, research on your product or service, and we've talked about some databases you can use today. Um, your target market, right? Your operations, your management potential, um, any problems you may encounter and solutions. Um, and that's really important when you're talking to potential investors or again, just your consumers to try to say, this may be present as a problem but um, I've already done my research about how I may address that. Um, and then any financial information or personnel information that you um, may have. So at the end of this um, particular ebook and all of the ebooks in this series, um, they have a generic template that has every section, what you should put in that section, the purpose of that section of your business plan. And then obviously um, there are other parts of the ebook that actually give real world examples. Um, so if you're looking, this particular volume has, if you're looking to open a wedding venue, I went to a wedding in May and it um, was a old farm that um, their particular crop, their particular product that that farm used to produce became, um, it wasn't sustainable. So they turned 
returned that um, facility, that site, all of their, their barns and all, everything else. They put a chapel or a chapel-like building on um, their farm and made it into a wedding venue. And that is how they have um, been able to turn huge profits. Um, and so wedding venue, wellness clinic, they even have um, like a fictional hardware store, um, uh, document scanning business. So um, this it can even give you an idea of businesses that you can start. And then the other kind of things that you can find in here um, are a glossary of small business terms. So this helps them research and helps you research kind of those different terms we may use. We've already probably used a little bit of jargon today um, that may not be um, something you're familiar with, um, but it also has a section of organizations, agencies, and consultants. So these are usually um, associations that may be of interest to entrepreneurs. And then they also have small business administration, regional offices, the small business development centers, um, a lot of different, like I said, um, organizations that are usually um, able to help um, small businesses. If you're looking to kind of go even beyond what you may, um, we have in NC Lab. Okay, next. I love talking about our um, training course that we have provided by NC Live because when I first became a business librarian here and even when I was at the public library, I really wanted to take this course, but it was a little cost prohibitive. So thanks to NC Live and EBSCO, we are able to provide the entrepreneurial mindset training course from um, the entrepreneurial learning um, initiative. Sorry, I'm looking at my notes. Learning Initiative, Eli, we call it for short. Um, and so uh, one of the things that this helps you do is it helps you learn information about entrepreneurship, but even how you can use that and how you're thinking about how you um, work um, go through life and how you may um, be able to speak to um, entrepreneurship as a reference point for just enhancing your life, not just starting a business. Um, so you can look at um, opportunities and best practices on design thinking. Um, you may actually even learn about like what it means to be a struggling entrepreneur and how you can kind of evaluate and kind of pivot your business if you need to. Um, and even like what success looks like, you know, what can actually harm, um, and again, talking about those problems, what can harm um, your business? Um, I'm sorry, I got distracted by the, <laughs> the chat um, in the long run. Um, and then how may you actually do some self-evaluation to think about what's holding you back? I found when I was at the public library, and even um, working with students here that they're usually um, starting their business as a side hustle, right? So they have schoolwork, they have um, their nine to five job, of course. And so what are those things that um, you may be able to do better to use your time more effectively? Um, and then it's just all about the mindset. Um, and I think that this is one of those things that um, I've even found that um, training like this helps me as a as a librarian, um, as someone who likes to think about um, how I personally can improve and move me forward in my career and um, um, like my personal life. So those are um, two that we really love. And I believe it used to be a thousand dollars. Um, but NC Lab is um, providing this for us. And when you tap into the training, um, you get access to it for a year. So if you start it, finish it within 365 days. Thank you, Angel. All right, um, so NC Live is wonderful, um, but they of course can't buy every amazing resource in the world. Um, but lucky for us, uh, there's a lot of really great open access resources out there. Now, um, you've probably heard us say this multiple times now, there's no perfect resource, right? There's no, very rarely are you gonna find like the perfect prepackaged report to answer every single question uh, a patient or customer is gonna come to you with. Um, so it's going to be a combination of things. It's going to be a combination of paid databases and then um, open access resources, uh, especially when I was a public business librarian, uh, I relied heavily on a combination of 
all of the above. Um, so the first resource um, I want to highlight that is available to anybody, uh, whether you are an NC Live subscriber or not, uh, is going to be the Census Business Builder. So Sean's already mentioned the Census. Uh, the Census platform has definitely gotten an upgrade. It's much better than it used to be, um, but that's still there's still a lot of data in there to navigate. And if you're not familiar with it, it can feel really overwhelming. So because uh, business owners, entrepreneurs, nonprofits uh, need some very, um, are looking for a lot of different statistics, uh, Census Business Builder is a great uh, kind of one-stop shop to find pretty much most of the quantitative information that a lot of business owners are looking for. Um, so this is just um, a one page I have here um, from the Census Business Builder, um, but you can see kind of from, from the small print, um, but it's gonna give them information about consumer spending on kind of broad categories. It's gonna give a basic breakdown of demographic information, economic information, um, how many business types are in a, are in a specific area. So it's a really great um, place to start um, for a lot of people who are especially interested in starting or growing a business uh, to get some information about the landscape. And it's a great way to kind of tap into multiple types of surveys that are available through the census and kind of one a foul swoop. Uh, the next resource I want to talk about is a nonprofit resource. Uh, so I think it's important to remember um, anybody who's interested in starting, running, growing a nonprofit, working for a nonprofit, that's a business, okay? It's just a business that uh, is not paying taxes either at a state or a federal level, okay? So a lot of everything we've mentioned here applies to nonprofits too. Um, and I know a lot of my questions, at, especially the public library, were from people wanting to start nonprofits or the all important, how do I get money from my nonprofit? Now there are of course great paid databases like Foundation Directory Online, um, but they are expensive. So if your library is not able to um, offer a subscription to your patrons, um, to Foundation Directory Online, you can actually get a lot of the information in these kind of very popular, expensive nonprofit databases through open access resources. And a good one is actually the IRS 990 Finder. All right, it's the IRS. It's not too sexy, okay? The interface is, is um, a little governmental, okay? Um, but it's going to tell you a lot of information for either somebody who's looking to start a nonprofit or is looking um, to find somebody to apply to a grant. OK, so one thing about nonprofits, everybody wants to start a nonprofit, but they don't do enough research to see, is there a nonprofit in our community who's already doing this thing, right? Because there's only a finite pool of funding available for these nonprofits. So a good first step for somebody wanting to start a nonprofit is to look and see, all right, is there anybody else doing this? Same goes with trying to find money. You want to find uh, a funder who um, is already kind of funding organizations like yours. And luckily, all that information can be fine in an, a 990 form. So what is a 990 form? A 990 form is something that a nonprofit um, that is certified at the federal level um, through the IRS has to fill out um, to uh, basically tell the, the IRS that they um, use their funding for charitable purposes. So it's a lot of really good information in there. It's just in a tax form. So you kind of got to know where to look. Um, so this is the IRS 990 Finder. Um, so you can kind of see what their search interface looks like, um, where it says search by um, what we say an EIN number, a employer identification number. You can actually drop that down, um, that menu down to search by organization. So you can kind of use that as like a keyword search. And then you can um, get more specific into your community, okay? And then from there, you could search for like, let's say you're having somebody who's interested in finding um, a fund so maybe they're looking for foundations, right? If, if the foundation is in the name, that's usually a grant making organization of some type. All right. Um, so here we go. We have an example of the Allendale Fund. Um, so first and foremost, we have a phone number. That's always really important for a funder. Um, we have some information about who's who. OK, so this is also really good for somebody looking to start a nonprofit so they can kind of get an understanding of who they need in the organization, um, how much might they pay somebody in that organization. Um, but you can find all that information there. This is also really good. You can see who they funded, what did they fund them for, how much did they fund them for, okay? All really um, 
good information that you can find, again, if you just know where to look. All right, so the last and perhaps the most important resource I want to mention here, and this kind of goes back to um, that ecosystem I was talking about earlier, like how do you get the word out that the library does all this stuff? Um, and that is your community ecosystem, okay? It is a total alphabet soup, all right? Business world, like education world, like library world loves their acronyms, all right? Um, but they, um, these acronyms are really useful acronyms to have. Um, so you can see on the screen, just um, in my community, I was at the Greensboro Public Library in Greensboro, North Carolina. These were some of the organizations um, in our community ecosystem, okay? So what is an ecosystem? So these are organizations, a lot of times they're nonprofits, but not always, that pretty much exist um, to support um, small businesses and nonprofits, all right? So we have SCORE, which stands for Service Corps of Retired Executives. We have um, the SBTDC, the Small Business Technology Development Center, okay? Um, but these are all organizations that provide kind of those services that we as librarians can't provide. So you have somebody who needs legal help. Well, does your community have a legal clinic or a college or university that has a legal clinic that maybe specializes in small business and entrepreneurship law? Elon Law is an example in North Carolina of one law school that does that. Um, does, do you have somebody who wants to start a business and like just needs all the help and doesn't know where to start? SCORE or the SBTDC, uh, SCORE, the retired executives. These are people that have actually run businesses before. It's a free mentorship service. Their website is full of templates and resources and tools. Um, so they can either use those or they can actually meet with somebody and get the help that they need. Um, the Chamber of Commerce, right? Like that's a great organization just to get connected into uh, because they usually know who all of these people are. So to that question of how do you let people know that the library is also a partner, right? Like you're feeling good about answering business questions and now you wanna do some outreach to let your community know, like, listen, we can help you make money, right? We can help you grow your dreams, your businesses, et cetera. Getting connected with these organizations is a great first step into um, letting the world know what your library can offer because a lot of entrepreneurs know about these organizations or along the line, somebody's going to refer them, whether it's the library or not, to one of these organizations. Um, and it's going to be these organizations that they go, hey, you know, I know you need to make a business plan, but you're really light on details. Go speak to the librarian to fill out some of these details and find the information that you need. Okay, so I would definitely um, recommend, um, you know, maybe start with your chamber. Most communities have a chamber. Um, make that connection there. Does your community have what we call an incubator? Right. So an incubator is kind of a place where businesses go to to really find all the support they need to get started. Get connected there. Does your community have a co-working space? get connected there. Um, I, a lot of times I did like a yearly meeting with SCORE uh, just to kind of update them on what the library has to offer. And then they did all the advertising for me, okay? So it's a, it, takes a, it takes a community, right? And um, these are your partners, just examples of your partners and the organization. All right, so just again, to kind of tie things up, some helpful do's and don'ts uh, when it comes uh, to doing business reference. Um, so again, use those reference interview skills. I also really want to highlight, it's okay to say, you know what, I'm going to have to get back to you. Um, it can feel like a lot, right, when somebody's asking you to, what was it, David, an FFPE tissue processing company or whatever. Uh, no idea what that is. And <laughs> what was it, David? Well, I can't remember the acronym now, but I Googled it. Yes. <laughs> and, and I Googled it and I found a list of companies that did that. And then I use that list of companies to go into a couple of databases to look for more information about the, the industry and the, how those particular companies did it. And one of the things I found was it is a very niche specialized industry. So there's not a lot on the industry itself. You have to kind of piece things together from each of the individual companies. Unfortunately, a lot of the individual companies are also private and that makes a whole that other makes it difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. But but to David's point, what he just said there, you know, Google is your friend, right? So 
take some time when you get those initial questions. You know, I have to look into this more. I'm not sure. Saying those words, you know what? I don't know, but let's find out together um, are so powerful, all right? And we use Google all the time. Um, we use YouTube all the time. Um, there are some fabulous, I think most of us are probably familiar with LibGuides. If you just go in Google and type in market research and LibGuide, there are fabulous librarians out there who've done a lot of the hard work for you in combining all these resources and all these tips into, into that nice package, right, that we always like to see. Um, there are resources out there for you as librarians. Blink is one. You'll get these slides after the fact. So that's a link out um, to the Blink's website where you can email us. Um, BizLib is this really famous um, business librarian listserv that I don't even know how many subscribers they have now, but you can send a question out into the ether. And I swear you will have like 50 responses. That's an exaggeration, but you'll have at least like five responses um, by the time you get back from lunch, all right? So it's a fabulous, fabulous resource that anybody can use. Um, so again, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Remember what Nancy said, you are, a, you are the um, research guide. You are not there to provide legal advice. You don't know everything about marketing. You're not, I, I always told people like, you know what? You don't want me managing your finances, right? You don't want me making your legal decisions. I have an MLIS. I do not have a law degree, okay? So don't trust me with that kind of stuff. But let me get you connected to maybe somebody who can help you. And, and by far, please don't panic when that business question comes your way. Uh, I'll let Angel real quickly here talk about some of these fabulous resources. Yeah, so of course, we're going to recommend some books for you that have been very helpful for a lot of um, business librarians. And I think this is great for you to have when um, you even meet with your um, patrons. Um, I definitely bring, um, so Nancy mentioned this one earlier, Making Sense of Business Reference. Um, I really love this embedded uh, business librarianship for public librarians. We actually had the author of that book come talk to Blink one time. Um, this is also a really great reference reference book, right? The Strauss Handbook of Business Information, Librarians, Students, and Research. It's really great there. Um, and this is a brand new, just published, I want to say like um, maybe three weeks ago, not even a month ago, Teaching Business Information Literacy. This is going to be great if you're thinking about hosting classes and instruction for um, business information. So you get some lesson plans in here, you get case studies, all that good stuff. Um, and then I want to recommend as someone um, who is uh, a chair for a brass committee, so the business reference um, and services section of ALA, um, we have a bunch of research guides. So we have those linked there. They're free and open to the public, just like the BizLib listserv. And with all all of these things together, you really can build your skills. So reduce your anxiety. Don't panic. And I, I cannot stress enough. Don't be afraid to say, I don't know, but I can find out or I'll, I'll do a couple of things here. I'll ask my business colleagues. I'll look to blink, you know, drop our name if you feel like it. <laughs> All right, so thank you all so much. Um, I know that was kind of a, a lot to, to cram into an hour. Uh, like I said, you're going to get these slides, so you're going to get our emails. My name is Morgan. I'm the chair of Blink. Um, all five of us are in Blink. Uh, and Angel, she represents us at a national level with Brass, with ALA. Um, so you have connections here in North Carolina, even if you're not in North Carolina. We're a pretty friendly group. Uh, so please don't hesitate to reach out to us. I will just plug um, Blink does have quarterly workshops that anybody can join. As Angel said, she dropped in the chat there. Um, we do have one coming up August 5th. It's in person and online. We're trying the hybrid thing. Pray for us. Um, but you can RSVP uh, for that if you'd like to join us. We always have a lot of fun. So um, with that said, I know we've got like five minutes left, but if there are any links, green questions anyone wants to ask we are here for you I just want to drop in and say I said this earlier to some um, library students that being a business librarian is um, 
good job security in a way. I think there has been six or eight positions posted just since January. Some of us have tried to keep track of them in their um, job description. So there are a lot of institutions and public libraries who are always looking for business librarians. So this is really something that um, I think all of us on the panel will say that, um, you know, um, business librarianship is something that is here um, around because it affects everyone business, um, all the things, um, and not just those looking to start a business, uh, but financial planning, right, financial um, literacy, um, learning those resources and being able to pick them off the top of your head um, can be a good resources even for yourself. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You all have done a very good deed this morning, reducing the intimidation um, and anxiety around business librarianship. Um, so thank you all so much for taking the time to do that. Um, folks, you'll get the recording and a follow-up survey, um, as well as I've compiled a list of NC Live resources. Um, I know that the presenters have shared their own open access free resources. Um, so take a look at that later today. I'll send it in a follow-up email. Um, but thank you all so much. I hope for our folks outside of North Carolina, um, please feel free to contact our presenters if you have any questions. Um, I know that there might be some overlap in the resources, but not always. Um, but if you're interested in checking out more of our training opportunities, um, take a look at our training calendar as well as our monthly training newsletter. Um, but I hope everybody has a good rest of their Thursday. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thanks, everyone.